In the year 2000, the United States ranked sixth in our Human Freedom Index. It now ranks 23. So there's this. This is a particular. Yeah, do you want to show that chart? Uh, yeah, just... here's, here's the ranking. We've got uh, Switzerland, New Zealand, Estonia, Denmark, Ireland rounding out the top five. And then you go down U.S. at 23 below Belgium and Austria and the United Kingdom. If you look at the graph of freedom in the United States, it doesn't look like the global the, the global mm -hmm. graph. It didn't. It wasn't increasing. Uh, uh, from okay. 2000. That's that's one of the worrisome things that that mm -hmm. that, that we found because mm -hmm. you asked why is there this increase? It's because all sorts of other countries were still increasing their freedom uh, around the world, and not, not the United States. The United States is a very worrisome trend, starting from around the year 2000 of a long-term steady decline in freedom that then with the with the global financial yeah. crisis it it, it it accelerated and um <clears throat> and we especially see that beginning in the year 2000 in the economic freedom side of things because of exactly the kinds of things that, that you mentioned and out of the five different indicators in, in economic freedom the broad categories that we look at size of government the legal system and property rights sound money freedom to trade and regulation all of them saw notable drops during during this uh period of time except that the rule of law indicator saw the biggest drop it was a mm. it was a very big drop and that accelerated with the financial crisis but that was already going on and it really started uh with the beginning of the bush administration and we think that that's due to a lot of things um, the wars, the war on terror, uh, mm -hmm. the war on drugs, um, <clears throat> the weakening of private property rights in the United States with the Kelo decision over a decade ago. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the financial crisis made things worse because there was a rise of crony capitalism, or at least what people perceived as crony capitalism, where, where uh, industries and, and in fact, particular companies close to power uh, got privileges uh, and massive amounts of bailouts, even though uh, that that wasn't necessarily justified. And all of these things combined to 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 weaken the rule of law because it's it's arbitrary and at the very least it's perceived as such. And when you have the rules of the game not uh, not viewed as as fair, that's a real threat to other freedoms. But we did see other other areas of, of freedom, like uh, government spending and uh, monetary policy and freedom to trade, start to uh, start to go down as well. Um, and this uh, accelerated during the financial crisis. It started to recover some, and with the pandemic, it it came down. Yep. Never did the United States recover its level of freedom that it had in the year two thousand. Um, when it when it used to rank uh, at the top, here's a here's a breakdown of the analysis of the United States. As you mentioned, rule of law as a is it a meager six point three um, movement, six point four affected negatively by the pandemic, of course. Size of government, six point eight. What are what are some of the immediate steps that should be taken to, you know, reverse these trends and, you know, get the U.S. at least back into the, the top 10 of, you know, freedom ranked countries. Well, I mean, th there's a lot that can be done on, in terms of economic freedom. We're way below in, in economic freedom than what we were in the year 2000. And that that's in terms of free trade, in terms of regulations, in terms of um, sound money. Uh, in, in every indicator, we're, we're below. And so all of those policies can, can be improved. The size of government is, is much larger today after Obama, after Trump, uh, during the Biden after Bush, administration. Right? Yeah, after I mean, Bush, it's just if, much larger than when Bush yeah. came in. If I may, in 2019, because this, you know, when we talk about the, the COVID exception, yeah. 2019 spending this was under Donald Trump uh, and it was a record at the time that the federal budget spent four or federal government spent 4.4 trillion dollars in 2020 it spent 6.6 .6 trillion dollars in 2021 6.8 last year it went down to 6.3 slightly this year it's estimated to be 6.4 and this is you know this seems to vindicate the uh, the Higgs hypothesis of a yeah. kind of ratchet effect 
So, you know, it's gone down from 6.8%, but it's much closer to that than it is to 4.4, which was already insane compared to, you know, Bill Clinton uh, 20 years earlier. That's right. So I think that 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 uh, hypothesis is still valid for the United States after these these crises. And, um, you know, there were several crises during the Bush administration, which yeah, yeah. Uh, which which did help to increase government spending at a time, at least in his the, the first part of his administration, where the Republicans controlled both, you know, uh, right. the, the, the Congress and the executive. And um, that's oftentimes not a good thing. Yeah, and it's interesting now, and not to get too in the weeds about, uh, you know, government uh, spending in, in America, but, you know, when when Obama came in uh, in 2009, he, of course, he won what was, con you know, what was rightly considered a mandate at the time, and the Democrats took, they uh, they had control of the House, but they took control of the Senate. He He did have a blank check for two years, and spending went up, and they got everything they wanted, basically, and that elected a Republican Congress, and then things started leveling off. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of divided government because it's, you know, at various points, it seems as if, you know, spending just keeps going up anyway. But, um, you know, at least in uh, the late Bush years and the, the second half of Obama, things leveled off a bit because it, it seemed... Uh, you know, a divided government put the put the brakes on certain spend. So uh, behind all of these trends is how people view government and how people feel mm -hmm. about society and and politics and, and so on. And uh, one of the things that we that we see is when you look at the global picture and you see the high point at 2007 and then it, it starts go, going down with the financial crisis. That's a period of time where you you really see the rise of different forms of populism during during mm -hmm. this uh, subsequent period of time all over the world, authoritarian populism of the left, of the right, uh, in a lot of countries just taking over. And in a lot of political systems, having a bigger say in politics, including in liberal democracies, as occur has occurred in the United States, I, I would argue, in both parties, um, <clears throat> the the the. What happened, I think, in the United States, uh, beginning during the uh, Bush administration, um, which, as I say, had its own crises and, and expanded mm -hmm. uh, the role of government, so it was reducing freedom, is if you look at the, at the um, surveys by Pew and by Gallup, you see that over the past 15 to 20 years in the United States, trust in almost every institution in society starts right. coming down and it's it's hitting record lows on so many different uh, institutions we're yeah. talking about um <clears throat> the the uh the media uh congress yeah. the executive uh, the things like the catholic church and philanthropies are the actually church, also philanthropies, seeing a, yeah. um uh businesses you know mm -hmm. big businesses and, and other kinds of businesses and so when when there is a loss of trust in the main institutions in society that mediate uh, interaction in society, uh, you're in Latin American territory. And that's when Trump came in. And that's, I, I very much view Trump as a Latin American populist, uh, mm -hmm. but I think that he didn't come out of nowhere. Something right. was going on in the United States that led people to think, hey, you know, the rules of the game aren't aren't fair anymore. We don't and, trust this institution or that institution. Yeah, and both he and Hillary Clinton, this was uh, striking to me in the rhetoric in 2016, they both explicitly said the system is broken. You know, they offered different reasons for why it yeah. was broken, what was broken in it, and how they would fix it. But it was uh, fairly chilling. And, you know, and I think on some profound level, accurate. I mean, certainly yeah. there's a reason why they were the candidates and they were both saying the system is broken. You can't trust the system. The system doesn't care about you. It's not watching out for you. But of cetera. course, they, they took no responsibility for that system. Yeah, that no, no, been, of course. Been a part of yeah. it. I think that that's been yeah. a really big problem for, for especially for the Democrats who um, uh, have a lot of... Uh, correct uh, gripes about uh, re Republicans or, or Trump, uh, they themselves have become, uh, at least a big part of the, the Democratic, has become uh, more radicalized, but they don't mm -hmm. take into uh, account the role that their ideas had and continue to have in creating the political polarization. I very much see the um, 
the, the political polarization in the United States and, the, and what's going on now as a legacy of Obama and even of, of Bush. Uh, so um, unfortunately, um, I don't think that there has been a great um, explanation uh, right. so far or analysis of why that has happened. And um, we can come up with a lot of plausible stories that I think can um, be compelling. But the fact of the matter is that this polarization and this rise of populisms, either on the left or right or, or both, has been going on all around the world in countries that are completely different from one another in yeah. terms of wealth, in terms of the uh, political system, in terms of culture. I mean, we're talking about this happening in Mexico and Chile, two very different mm -hmm. uh, societies, and in uh, India and in Hungary. And, you know, the, the hardening of nationalisms and so on in Russia and in China, Turkey and in uh, parts of Western Europe where major political parties have become uh, radicalized or include very radical uh, parties as part of their coalitions. Hey, thanks for watching that excerpt from our conversation with Ian Vasquez of the Cato Institute about the state of human freedom worldwide post COVID. You can watch our full conversation right here or another clip from that conversation right here and subscribe to Reason TV to get these conversations live every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern.